Good afternoon. My name is Nico Kreukers, and I'm a professor of Radboud University Medical School, uh, responsible for the dental education. The Parantion organization asked me to provide a keynote on an innovative interprofessional dental clinical learning environment using entrustable professional activities, and I'm delighted to do so. Our dental curriculum is based on a few principles, but before you can understand why we have organized it in this way, it's good to have a little bit knowledge about the background because not everybody attending this keynote is from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, the undergraduate dental curriculum comprises a three-year bachelor program and a three-year master's. The key figures of the Radboud UMC Dental School are we have 76 new students starting each year, so 76 in each class. We have a total of 20 to 7 full-time equivalent teachers, amongst them six professors, and in total we have 300 employees, most of them working part-time at our dental school. The students have a courses for 1,680 hours per year, which means that they attend dental school or work and study for 40 weeks of 42 hours. About 30% of that time are contact hours between teachers and students. Beside that, we host 240 hygienists, oral hygienist students, who follow a four years program. But the oral hygienist students they, they are um, organized um, in another organization. In total, our dental school has 128 clinical units. The edu educational principles we follow are listed in this slide. We offer our students a practice-based learning environment um, so that they can have a longitudinal integrated clerkship. We include interprofessional education, which means that dental students and oral hygienist students work together. Our education is competency-based, and we try to entrust our students um, at certain moments to do um, certain treatments by themselves. Self-determination and self-regulation are also important in our uh, educational program and we try to develop lifelong learning professionals. So learning by doing is one of the most important things in our uh, master curriculum. The clinical program in the master curriculum uh, comprise a student-run dental clinic, which is for eight hours per week during three years. And besides that, we have minors, uh, we call it specialist minors, for four hours per week. These minors include reconstructive dentistry, surgical dentistry, a profile called child and development, and gerodontology. And besides that, we also have several internships. Our students go for three weeks to an affiliated dental practice somewhere in the Netherlands. We have seven weeks internship at the Department of Oral Surgery, a two weeks internship in geriatric dentistry, also in another place, uh, in nursing homes, and we have a two weeks elective internship. The backbone of the master curriculum is the student-run dental clinic. It's organized in a way that fourth, fifth, and sixth year students, so master one, master two, master three students, work together in a team. We have about 18 of these teams, um, which treat uh, approximately 750 patients. And as said, 10 to 11 students are included, also four to five oral hygienist students, and they have one dental teacher. And for a group of three master clinics, we have one oral hygienist teacher. So the teaching environment is completely focused on interprofessional education. The teaching tools we used are team-based learning, 
We work with impressive professional activities. We include peer teaching and also peer fact. It plays an important role in uh, our uh, dental curriculum. As I said, we have 18 so-called master clinics. And a master clinic is a unit in the student-run dental clinic for interprofessional practice learning for master dental students and for oral hygiene students. In that master clinic, the student develops the competences that are, that are needed to, to become a licensed dentist or a licensed oral hygienist. And the student acquires these competences by performing so-called and trustable professional activities. Um, EPAS. EPAS operationalizes competence-based education and it facilitates learning and guidance of learning in a clinical workplace. And in the lecture, Professor Oratankata, there's more explained about what an EPA is exactly. Here we see a diagram showing how the student dental run clinic is organized. So we have three master clinics, they are clustered together. There's one teacher coordinator, and there's also one student coordinator. And this is also important because this student coordinator is responsible for organizing uh, a lot of things uh, around uh, emergency cases, um, how stu students can help each other, so that student that is a very important uh, has a very important role. In each master clinic, we have four dental students from M1, so the fourth year students, four of M2, and four of M3, together with four to five hygienists and one teacher. And I said they treat 750 patients, and with the whole student-run dental clinic. We, uh, we manage the oral health care for approximately 13 and a half thousand patients. It's also possible that um, students of the fourth, fifth and sixth year, so M1, M2 and M3, they cluster together and they have a specialized teacher for specialized skills training. It's easy to organize because we have those clusters and um, those clusters have practicum at the same time, and you can also divide them according to year. Besides the clinical work in the student-run clinic, we also have what we call academic clinical reasoning, and this is accompanying the clinical work. In this teaching module, uh, in which again, fourth, fifth, and sixth year students work together, the students acquire competences for evidence-guided practice. And the way how it works can be seen in the picture, uh, where you see the two teachers sitting in the background, and the student is organizing and uh, leading uh, the session and doing a presentation. In this academic clinical reasoning, we make treatment plans, we train in making treatment plans, we have clinical lessons, we have evidence-based uh, practice, um, we have guidelines for dental interventions, we work on interprofessional development, sometimes we cover ethical issues and uh, they, the students get a training and responsible referrals. Peer teaching and peer assessment is also uh, important in, uh, in this academic clinical reasoning. And we give seminars, teachers from outside sometimes come, and there are tutorials. The teaching tools in this academic clinical reasoning are team-based learning. We give lectures fitting to the level of the students. They work in groups of around eight students sometimes, so we divide a, a, a cluster sometimes. And there's, and it's very much important, peer teaching. So the students have to prepare for that. As said, we work with EPAs in the student-run dental clinic. And why is that? It facilitates the learning process 
of the, let's say, modern students. It gives the responsibility for learning to the, to the student, him or herself, so the student is responsible. It provides an opportunity for the development of a professional identity, and it helps to develop an attitude of lifelong learning. We think that it leads to competency-based education that merges with competency-based practice, and it supports monitoring and evaluation of the student progress for teacher and students. An untrustable professional activity is a professional activity that is entrusted to a student with sufficient competences and can be accomplished in a defined time frame. They are as much as possible defined as observational behavior. So a teacher or somebody else can see what is done, is being done. And the descriptions of EPAs include both knowledge, skills, attitude, and behavior. EPAs are part of daily clinical work. They're easy to, to recognize. In our student dental run, uh, student run dental clinic, we have 14 EPAs for dental students. And here you see the list of EPAs we use. And the dentists among you can see that this almost covers the whole work of a dental uh, of a dentist in, in in the general practice. But I said that we have an interprofessional uh, learning environment. So also oral hygienists are using EPAs, EPAs, but not all of them. For all oral hygienists, we have five. You see them here in blue. The other, the, the ones in grey are not uh, in in the package of an oral hygienist, and we share the rubrics. So we think that in diagnostics and in treatment planning, and all the other EPAs you see here, that the rubrics and the level of the quality should be the same for oral hygiene students and for dental students. It's important to recognize that in the Netherlands, oral hygienists are allowed to treat primary carious lesions. And this is not the case in other countries, I know that, but in the Netherlands, it's, uh, it's allowed that they do that. So they have to meet the same level and the same quality as dentists do. I would like to close this short presentation with a movie, a short uh, animated cartoon, which shows how we use the EPAs in our student dental, student run dental clinic, excuse me. So I'm starting the movie now. This is Emma, a 23 year old dental student. She's now in the second year of the Dental Master Programme of the Radboud University, Nijmegen. Twice a week, Emma works in the SRDC where most of the clinical work in the master curriculum takes place. At the start of the day in the SRDC, Emma and her team arrive in the SDC for the briefing. The briefing is chaired by one of the students. After the briefing, Emma chooses the EPA she's going to work on today. Here we see Emma treating her patient, supervised by an experienced supervisor. At the same time, about 10 fellow students treat their own patient, also supervised by the supervisor. Emma and the supervisor discuss the treatment of the patient and the supervisor gives Emma feedback. At the end of the morning, Emma completes a digital EPA form. She reflects on technical aspects and professional behavior during the treatment of one particular patient. Emma sends her completed EPA form digitally to her supervisor. The supervisor opens the EPA form and reads the self-assessment of Emma. After that, Emma and the supervisor discuss the EPA form. The supervisor completes the EPA form with additional feedback. Here we see the self-assessment of Emma including the feedback of her supervisor. 
The supervisor and Emma complete the EPA form and the supervisor closes the Scorion program. Using EPAs, students are gradually entrusted based on the work they have been showing in the past practicums and the trust supervisors give them for the future. During their years in the SRDC, students build up an extensive portfolio of EPAs, including self-assessment and assessments by supervisors. Both students and supervisors can see all EPA forms and feedback at any time. Here we see the so-called dashboard that gives an extensive overview of the portfolio of the students, both on group level and individual level. In total, after three years of participating in the SRDC, Emma has approximately 240 completed EPA forms in her portfolio. After three years in the master program and in the SRDC, Emma graduates. Her extensive portfolio now is a good starting point for the rest of her career since she can use her past experiences to build onto and to become a lifelong learner. For more information, contact Radboud UMC University Medical Center Dentistry. Okay, so um, thank you very much, uh, Nico. And um, I think we can, uh, because Nico is now live uh, with us, uh, I don't know if people see uh, Nico, I still see a movie, but um, I think we can take some uh, um, questions if there are any. Um, Let me see, Nico, you can turn on your uh, your microphone if you want to. Uh, and you can join us live. Yes, I'm in now. OK, let me see if there is. Uh, I see some uh, people who ask about the movie, but uh, most of the problems seem to be solved. Um, so we can take any uh, questions if there is. Uh, let me see, is there much time to take some questions? Yeah, we have a few minutes. Um, I see one question about the integration of your programs. Um, let me see. Oh, the, someone asked why you chosen for 14 EPAs. Is that is there a specific reason for that? Well, <clears throat> uh, the reason is um, you, you can you can make EPAs or define EPAs at, at different levels, very specific for each for small parts of a total treatment or for a total treatment. And uh, we decided not to go to too much into detail. Um, um, other systems, they go very much into details because they want to evaluate also small steps in treatment. Um, the fourth thing, and the, so that, that was a, a choice on purpose uh, for this undergraduate situation. In the EPAs, you still have some steps. You, we, we could not show that. Still some, step, some steps that can be assessed and uh, where, where students and teachers can reflect uh, on a more detailed level. Uh, but we didn't make separate EPA, EPAs about that. And the 14 is, I think, uh, if you you take that together, that's well covering all the work. Uh, uh, a dentist that who is just starting a practice um, who, where, where they have the, uh, they need the competences for. So that's the reason why it ended up to become 14. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Nico, for, uh, for the answer. Uh, I have another question for you. Uh, someone who said it, uh, it looks like there's a lot of bureaucratic in this uh, way of working. Is that, uh, do you agree I'm with sorry. this? There was I'm sorry, that was a question. Can you I, repeat? I can repeat that. Um, 
it looks like a bureaucratic system if you uh, if you look at all the things you have to fill out uh, and is there a lot of workload to use such a system mm, in the beginning our teachers had the same feeling that again they had to fill out forms and things like that but in this case the most most of the work is done by the students and what we do is reflect on the reflection of the students. Um, in our uh, practicum, which takes four hours, we have half an hour at the end, because not all students are ready at the same time, where we uh, talk with the students, have a look at the, uh, the forms, and normally, uh, I would say 90 or 95% of the, of the times, uh, everything is finished at the end of, of the practicum. So um, it's part of teaching, giving reflection. It's not uh, only doing technical things, it's not, not giving uh, uh, education, not, not, not teaching. This is also part of teaching. And okay. the bureaucratic thing is, is very, uh, yeah, I would say, not dominant, really not dominant. And now our teachers are very happy with it, and the students okay. too. Thank you, Nico. There was a, there was the second part of this question. Does it stimulate learning in its uh, current configuration? And I assume then uh, that it's yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have I one well, last. I have to say I have to say that we uh, we are of course of course doing some research on that, and we will publish on that also uh, to, uh, with with some data on how it is uh, helping students uh, in learning and how it's helping us in teaching. OK, thank you. Uh, the last question uh, I see there is someone has a very practical question. Um, if someone starts with pain diagnostic and then, for example, starts an endo, I believe that's EPA six in my uh, if I remember, uh, does the student uh, change the EPA number? No, no, the students uh, at the beginning of the of the, uh, the practicum, uh, the clinic, the student chooses the EPA he wants to uh, to complete uh, and he wants to uh, reflect on and we don't change that. So the total of the EPAs, the 240, the students have to organize by themselves and um, because they work in a group, um, uh, patients are referred also sometimes. Each patient has a case manager, who is, which is one student who is responsible for the treatment planning and also for the, uh, the progress of, of the treatment. And uh, um, when, when the student is not ready for a treatment because he doesn't have any expertise or competences to do that, then the, the patient will be referred to another student. But to go back to the, to the question, uh, at the beginning of the practicum, the student let the teacher know, this is the APA I'm going to work on today. Although sometimes he does more things than just that one. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Nico. I'm very glad that uh, despite the technical problems, we could still uh, have you here in the live uh, session. Like um, um, it, it, it sounded a little like uh, you're on a train station. That was not your uh, your fault. You couldn't help that. Uh, it's a, well, that's a coincidence if you have to improvise. Um, I make we make sure that we uh, get a proper a movie to all the participants uh, maybe later and uh, we're going to fix that um, and all the listeners. Uh, well, I'm sorry for uh, for this inconvenient, but I hope you could understand the slides were pretty, pretty clear. So that was uh, that was uh, 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 good enough, I hope. Um, 